Welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. You guys know the drill. We're going to talk a little bit about USC football. Good show this week. Lots of interesting stuff going on with recruiting and 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 talk about a new college football playoff system and all the rest. So last week's show maybe a little like a day school, guys. I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't like it. This 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 week's show, we were saving everything for this week. It's gonna be big. Uh all right, you guys know uh, you guys know the usual crowd, so we're going to do it quick. Mark Culkin writes numerous articles, has his own podcast, and uh, does the uh, daily practice reports for football and basketball. Crowd favorite, Mark, welcome. Eric McKinney, editor-in-chief of We Are SC, as you might imagine, also does a lot of writing uh, for We Are SC, which if you're not a premium member, Go subscribe. This is ridiculous. It costs you next to nothing the first month. It's a buck. Even after that, it's cheap. It's the best deal of your life. Go sign up. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Eric is going to uh, uh, Eric's going to lead us off in a minute talking about recruiting because he is, in fact, a bona fide recruiting guru. They gave him a card and everything. Uh, okay, guys, are we ready to do this? All right, so another week down, another week of uh, – Spring practice, another big recruiting weekend. Again, all unofficial visitors. Um, a lot of big news there. So let's start there. Eric, give us the uh, give us the highlights from this latest recruiting weekend. What happened? More commitments, more spring commitments for for a USC class that we talked a, a while ago when Justice Terry came in. Uh, how big that was the five star defensive lineman from Georgia and that weekend he was he was commitment number two in this class they, they sat with Juju Lewis for a long time and that was the only guy in there they're up to I, I think 10 right now uh, and and that's in a a couple weeks a couple weeks of spring ball and, and getting guys on campus uh, they're number three nationally number two in the big 10 and and that's that's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. When we talked, I think last class, it was like five, I think, in the Big Ten for USC. This is this is more like it now. Um, and it's the the new commitments are interesting. Two of them on Sunday, uh, both gonna play running back at USC. That's a spot where they needed to add guys there. Um it's all right. A new coach comes in, Anthony Jones Jr., and he has hit the ground running. He's got three commitments in a matter of it feels like hours that he's been at USC. And so these are relationships that he's built, guys that he's really liked. Uh, and what he's done is gone out and gotten a kid from Texas, a kid from Tennessee and a kid from Virginia. That shows the reach right now. And I think the the national momentum that USC has the specifically. So Harry Dalton uh, is the, the Virginia running back and he comes over three star in the industry rankings. He's a guy that, that on three specifically is higher on a four star and, and number two forty four nationally. And then Dewan Morris from Tennessee, uh, another kind of three star back. What stands out to me about these guys. And, and I, I'm assuming you guys will want to hit on this too. They both play some wildcat quarterback uh, and and they throw the ball a little bit too. Like Harry Dalton is like a, a quarterback quarterback. I mean, he, he threw for 1300 yards this past year, I think over 2000 the year before. And so you're starting to add some players where you can do a lot of different things. And what I like just as, as future running backs that play wildcat quarterback it makes you, I I think it gives you a better understanding of kind of reading defenses because you're looking at how plays are unfolding, if you need to hand off, if you can keep. Uh, and, and I think just the vision can be a little bit better. Now, I will say but before I hand it off here, the interesting thing to me when you talk about, oh, this guy could could be this, he could be a receiver, he could be a running back, he can do this, he can do this. In college now, you better find a spot. You better you better find a spot where you can stick and be really good there because guess what? USC is going to bring in a running back in the 26th class, 27th class, transfer portal, wherever it is, 
who is a really good running back. And so if you're not that guy, then you're not going to play. And there's only so many kind of gadget stuff you can do because the same thing goes at wide receiver. If there's a guy who can play some receiver, play some running back, you're going to have a better receiver. You're going to have a better running back. So I don't, I don't want to sound the alarm and say, Oh, this isn't a good pickup or anything like that. These guys were highly coveted by big time schools and these are big commitments. And I think their, their ratings are going to go up during their senior seasons. But it's an interesting thing when you talk about kind of, oh, there, there's a ton of versatility here. Yes, but you you better really get good at, at one spot if you want to see the field a lot during your college career. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, Mark, what do you think? What do you think on these commitments and just the state of recruiting in general? I mean, obviously recruiting is going pretty well. I mean, when you're picking up, they're averaging what a recruit a day. It feels like it. Uh, Anthony <laughs> Anthony Jones Jr. last coach in, uh, first coach with three commitments um, right off the bat. I mean, the thing that Eric was talking about with the running backs, the thing that really stands out, uh, still not a running back from the state of California anywhere in sight coming on board yet. So you're wondering what what's going on there. You know, I think we've talked about, you know, the name Carson Cox. Apparently, he's still at the top of USC's leaderboard at the running back position. But, you know, they're not waiting to take commitments from guys they want. You know, you have Dewan Morris. You mentioned Harry Dalton the III. Uh, you know, Eric's saying they need to find their spot once they get here and, and become good at that spot. I, I I understand where he's coming from, but the fact that these guys are athletes, they're going to have the ability to maybe showcase their their, their skill set at different positions. And the coaches can say, you know what? Yeah, you wanted to come here as a running back, but let's put you at the slot. That's your best position. Uh, kind of like what they were trying to do with Rayleigh Brown. You know, you, you, you find the guys that are out there and, and then bring them in. You don't want to force them into your system, but you want to be able to at least give them an opportunity to play in your system. Whether it works out a year or two from now, who knows? Uh, when they're recruiting the the cornerbacks, um, look, you have to be at least six foot two or taller to ride the Trojan ride, or you're not going to be. A, just don't even get in line, right? Uh, no, I'm Chris. Look, you're not the tallest of cornerbacks in your day, so you wouldn't even be on no. this team. Well, I wouldn't have been for all kinds of reasons, actually. Mark. <laughs> that was the least of my concerns. But yeah, you can see. They're looking for a specific type of player, whether it's, you know, size at running back, speed at running back, elusiveness, athleticism. They're ob they obviously have something they're looking for at the cornerback position. So I don't think there's anything to complain about with recruiting. You know, you, you'll hear the some guy from the, you know, from the peanut gallery saying, well, that's another three star. Well, I, I think everybody knows how I feel about the star system. And I think we have a, question coming up later in the show that we'll talk about that a little bit too but uh, as far as recruiting it's great i'm good with it uh eric talked about it a little bit and chris you can hammer the point uh hammer the point home you guys got you've got guys committing now like a justice terry or even an isaiah gibson from across the country you got to keep them committed that's going to be the biggest challenge once you get them on board yeah yeah, it's a nice spot to be in, though, right? I mean, uh, in over the last five, ten years, uh, I would have loved to have been just in in the hunt for some of these guys that are now verbally committing. Um, somebody asked Coach Jones uh, last week what he's looking for, and I think he said, I'm looking for guys that are smart, fast, and tough, right? Mark's question. Um, Eric mentioned that uh, you have some guys who have played – quarterback at least a little bit of quarterback in some cases a lot I think that helps you gauge smart right I mean that's one of the things that because the thing is uh, in high school especially when you have a guy who's a great athlete particularly if he plays at a good program where he has guys blocking for him effectively um, you can tell you can tell how big a kid is you can tell how fast he is um, there are some things that are harder to tell and, and sometimes, especially just watching a kid play running back in high school, how smart he is is pretty difficult. But you watch enough tape on a high school quarterback and, and you can make some generalizations, right? This is a guy who understands how to make his reads. He's a guy who understands the offense. And so, uh, so that may be a sign that that's one way to, that's one way to say, you know, a kid like, uh, like Dalton is, is tough. Um, he's also 
He's also pretty big, right? I mean, he's not huge, but six foot 205 right now. This is a guy who's going to be 220 by the time he shows up on campus. He's going to run the ball at 235, 240, right? It's a big back and a physical back. If you watch his, if you watch his highlights, he's a guy who's looking to deliver a pain, a painful blow. And that's just who he is. So um I agree that you're likely to hear some people complain about, oh, three-star commitments. Here's the thing. I like five-star commitments as much as the next guy. There's no reason to believe that USC is reaching this early in the process, right? They're not taking these guys because they think, oh, we have to take somebody now or we can't get somebody before December, especially with how recruiting is going with USC. Shoot, for that matter, just Lincoln Riley's um, – position as one of the top offensive coaches in the country getting skill position guys isn't something that Lincoln Riley has to worry about very often they're not reaching for these guys these are guys they want and if you watch the if you watch the tape you can see why I already talked about Dalton um the receiver kid um remind me Eric you had a, you had a smaller kid um you had a smaller kid from the east coast a kid that um had oh, a Rom Romero Eisen Eisen, right? Romero Eisen, who is almost certainly going to be a part of this class. And you're talking about a guy who ran 10-8 in the 100 as a sophomore. He's not very big, but he can run. He's going to get faster. Uh, and you look at a guy like that and say, I don't, I don't care if it's three stars. That guy can play. He can really move. And and that's why there are a lot of big time programs after. And he's so, he's another guy, right? On three's got him a four star, a top 300 kid. I mean, the, the, these are these are guys again. The idea, the idea that all three stars or low four stars or whatever are created equal. No, the, if if you are considered kind of that upper tier three star, and and we talked about this a lot when when I was at ESPN because those rankings get get hammered a lot. And what they say is if you are a three star. The idea of that ranking is that you are a potential all-conference player when you get there. Like that that's kind of what the expectation is. I'll take a few of those. You, you take a few of those in in every class. And so the idea that only five star guys are the only guys who are going to contribute or be good, it's like saying we're only if we're an NFL team, we're only going to get production from our first round pick. No, if you hit your fifth round, sixth round, seventh round picks. That's what makes you a, a good franchise and a team that can keep winning. That's it. You find those three-star guys. You have to have them in your class, the three-star, low, four-star guys. You have to hit on them. USC just went too, too many years where they didn't hit on five-star guys, four-star guys, or three-star guys, and it was just too many swings and misses there. So these are, and, and you mentioned it too, Chris, what stands out, these guys are just athletes that can make plays. They get the ball in their hand, and it's that they are gone. And it doesn't feel like it's one of those where that's because the 10 guys they're playing with are the 10 best players on the field, and they everything's just wide open. I mean, they're, they're making guys miss. They're running it over guys, and, and that's what stands out, I think, about these running backs. This Just that natural feel and ability at the position is, is pretty outstanding. Yeah, uh, I mean, look at Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to, I would say running back is probably the easiest position to evaluate uh, when you're, when you're considering, you know, guys coming out of high school, you can sense you, you're, you have a natural ability to play running back. And if you can add, you know, speed and toughness and physicality to that, you know, it doesn't matter. Again, look at the programs that are recruiting you, not how many stars are hanging around your neck. Yeah. I mean, look, it doesn't matter if you can recruit five stars because five star guys are the guys that everybody wants. And they do have a very high percentage of hitting, right? Five star guys, there are five star busts. USC's had some of them. Um, but five star guys probably got a 45% chance of being, of being selected pretty early in the NFL draft. That's not true of a three star player, but everybody takes three stars. Everybody does. Nick Saban did, Pete Carroll did, Urban Meyer did, Kirby Smart does. Because that's where that's where your own individual scouting becomes important. There are a lot of really great three-star players. USC's not reaching. They're picking the guys they want. They may or may not be right about that. But I would suggest that they've done pretty good in Lincoln Riley's tenure at finding guys who are a little bit undervalued. And then they show up on campus, and it turns out they can play a little bit, right? We saw that especially with the guys in the trenches the last two years. You have a bunch of guys who 
are three star players and everybody's belly aching about the fact that USC didn't land a high four star or five star. But then they show up on campus and they're big and they move pretty well. And the coaches are talking about how good they are. So I, I, I this is this is a good turn of events. If USC finds somebody they like better, USC will undoubtedly do what every program in the country does, and they will encourage the player to go elsewhere. But I think these are guys that they want. And when you watch the tape, it looks like they're guys that they should want. These look like football players to me. So uh, another really good unofficial uh, uh, recruiting weekend. I think it's safe to say there are some other guys who, I may have mentioned one of them, there are some other guys who seem to be very, very close to being willing to pull the trigger for USC. Um, we don't have to make predictions, but let's talk about some of the guys that fans should be keeping their eyes on in the coming weeks or months. Guys who it looks like USC has a legitimate shot at who and may very and may very well pull the trigger in the spring or the summer. Who, who should we be looking at, Eric? Uh, right up front, Trajan Odom. He he was on campus. Uh, he's another defensive lineman, a guy that kind of early on Eric Henderson seemed to gravitate towards and and be out there in uh north uh, north carolina he was born in los angeles in inglewood his mom is a is a uh college women's basketball coach so when she was at she was at ucla i believe like 05 to 08 um and and so he was born here his uh mom and dad both went to cal so he's got some california kind of connection los angeles roots a little bit he's out there in in uh north carolina but uh, again another guy that usc seemed to point to pretty early and say hey that that's our guy and again another guy who's in, in the industry rankings a four star 277 overall but the on three rankings four star 120 overall number 11 defensive lineman so uh Again, a guy where that's going to be interesting to see how that ranking shakes out, but a priority target. And this is one of those, if USC can get him, you are going head to head with Ohio State, LSU and Oregon as the schools that really, really want him. And this is just a few weeks ago that he had said Oregon's my number one coming off a visit to there. And so that's what you want from USC recruiting, right? When you can go head to head for a, a defensive lineman across the country with those kinds of offers and official visits already set up to those schools, if that's a guy you can reel in, now you're really, I mean, it, we already talked about this with Justice Terry, right? You've already done it, but now you're continuing to do it. And that's how you keep winning on the field, off the field, on the trail, all of that. So for me, he's he's number one in terms of what that can mean if USC can reel in a commitment there. I, I think the one position room that hasn't really contributed to recruiting yet is the offensive line group. So, you know, Josh Henson, you know what? There's a Mackie Stewart out there. there there's a Malachi, Malachi Goodman. Um, USC can, can keep stacking that offensive line room. I'm hoping yeah. – no, go ahead, Chris. No, 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 finish. I'm just hoping, look, I heard Hilton Stubbs say something over the weekend on social media of why Florida is no longer the team of choice for him. And it's something that should resonate really strongly with USC fans. You know, he's, he said, well, I'm just kind of in wait and see mode, wait and see mode with Florida right now. He wants to see what the team looks like. They, they've kind of dropped off from what Florida football should be. And, you know, that's kind of where USC football was in the last few years before Lincoln Riley arrived. So I'm just kind of wondering, is are there are offensive line recruits, prospects saying, I'm going to wait and see mode because, hey, USC's recruited really well there the last couple of cycles. They brought in 10 high school offensive linemen. Now they get to see, are those guys being developed? Are they going to contribute on the field? So that's where I would point out to maybe we want to see a little bit more from recruiting is on from the offensive line room. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, as you pointed out, Josh Henson has done a pretty good job of bringing in big classes with big bodies, and uh, and 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 some of and some of those guys already. You you have indications that they're going to step in and play a huge role, even as young guys. Um, I, I suspect that Henson will be able to land again, but it, it is interesting that he has, with a couple of exceptions, 
he has made his living with guys that he thinks are under the radar, right? Big body guys who are three star, maybe low, low four star guys, but it's not the guys that the national recruiting people are talking about. And, and so I, I suspect that, that he'll have no trouble finding those guys again, if that's what he wants. Um, it is interesting though, that Elijah page was that guy yep. in that club, right? He, he was, he was the big national guy and who's kind of front of the line to start at left tackle in, in his second year. So we talk about recruiting, right? There, there's, yep. there are those guys out there that you definitely want to bring in. And in, and in this incoming freshman class, uh, he's not going to start, but Jason uh, Zanavella, I hope I said his name right. Um, this is a guy who was also an elite recruit who is probably somebody who is a sophomore is going to be on the field, right? I mean, so he he's landed some of those guys, but he's also landed some guys that a lot of people looked at and said, I don't know what we have here, but he says, what we have here is a guy 335 pounds with good feet. I think I can work with that. Um you know, the one position where we've seen, and, and Mark mentioned it already, the one position where we've seen a real difference in recruiting is at, uh, is at the corner spot. USC has a bunch of really long corners right now, and that seems to be what they're, what they're looking for in the high school ranks. I mean, you're going to have U- – USC's corners almost look like small forwards. Uh, and, and so this is clearly something that the coaches are focused on, and – and I know that there's some big, uh, some big corners that they're pursuing right now that they think they have a good shot at. So I think you're gonna, I think you're gonna see a couple more six one or even six two, six three guys sign on at some point soon. And um, but that's it's interesting to see. They asked uh, Anthony Jones what he was looking for in a running back. It's pretty clear what USC is looking for in corners. They're looking for, they're looking for tall guys with big wingspan. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, about on the field we didn't we don't get to see much of it but when we get to see a little bit we get to hear from the coaches afterwards well what happened in the uh, spring practices this past week that uh, is worth talking about did we learn anything I I think I I think we learned that Eric Gentry is much happier so far this spring compared to last year though look I, I I don't think he wanted to throw the old staff under the bus the way it came out but, you know, I'm just going to read the quote. It's not complicated. I'm feeling good about it. And it's, it's, it's not a lot of overthinking or nothing I've got to do. Just play football. And here's the indictment. They know what to do. Know where to put me at. And then making me feel comfortable where I'm at. It feels good to have people who know what to do with me. Close the quote. Um, I mean, that's a mouthful. I mean, that says a lot. So you ha- you have that going on. Um, you had Lincoln Riley was pretty candid with his words uh, after Saturday's practice via Zoom. You know, he, he he talked about how the offensive line, go back to them, how the veterans, they, they have to step up and how maybe they didn't do such a great job of doing that last year in certain situations. Uh, and they also, you know, jumping right back into the linebacker room, Anthony Beavers, um, he's, getting, he's getting some run there. Apparently he's like one of the surest tacklers on the team and whatever he did, at the end of last season that carried over into the holiday bowl, it's carrying over the spring. So uh, there's a lot going on that we don't get to hear about, see, but we get to hear about. And those are com- some of the things that I picked up on when Coach Riley spoke with us on Saturday. Yeah. What, what, what do you think, Eric? Yeah. That inside linebacker position is interesting. I still think there's a lot that they can and will do with Eric Gentry. It it becomes a little bit what I talked about with those incoming running backs, where if Eric Gentry, and I think we talked about it last year, because I think you, or last week, I think you mentioned it, where you don't want Eric Gentry to be a third and 13 rush end for, for this team. You want to find ways where he can be on the field and moving him around so much do you have first down, second down, third down plays where he's in three different positions? I I don't know. Maybe you do. And and maybe that's how he gets used. But I think he can be kind of that big overhang defender, kind of like a a nickel a little bit. I think he could play there. I think he could play some just true inside linebacker, maybe not middle, but, but obviously on, on the weak side. Uh, And then, yeah, I, I think that you could bring him in. They, you know, a lot of schools have like, that NASCAR package, right? We have four defensive ends lined up as a pass rush um, 
you know, again, on, on like a third and long. And so maybe he's part of that. So, so it's interesting, but what I took away from what Matt Ence was talking about a little bit is he talked about the three veterans in Mason Cobb and Gentry, and then Easton Mascarenas Arnold as being kind of, I guess, as advertised a step, a step ahead. And, and he was been impressed with sort of their play on the field and also their leadership it still feels like that spot might be, and, and I think every spot is open for a transfer portal addition, but I I think maybe that's a, a spot where USC could have some eyes in the portal for a veteran. It's going to, if, if those are your three reliable guys, I think they've got some talented freshmen, but Rajon Davis, they talked about, he's got a, a banged up hand and a banged up wrist this spring and Garrison Madden doesn't still doesn't get talked about. And again, I, I think he's, Probably we knew coming in a, a three-year project to where he's going to be able to get there. So I don't know how much you expect right now this year, and and maybe it happens this offseason. But just three linebackers, if that's what you're confident with, and one of them is like playing a, a few different things, you're doing a few different things with them, that, that doesn't feel like a position that is coming from a, a position of strength if you're saying... No, we're flipping this defense around in one year. We're going to be an elite defense. We're going to be one of the best in the Big Ten. Feels like you still maybe need to add something to that group in a in a sure thing veteran. And if if you do that, it it might shake things up there a little bit. And that's always going to be kind of the the plus minus of of adding guys late in that in that second window. Yeah, I. Mark mentioned Eric Gentry's comments. Those obviously caught me too, but it was actually the piece that um, the piece caught my eye was we're not overthinking it. It's it's not too complex. One of the fundamental problems that the defense had last year is that it it looked like guys didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. And we're still trying to figure it out after the snap. And it's hard to play. It's hard to play football, especially it's hard to play defense that way. Um, If, if, if the, if the responsibilities are unclear, I suspect it's not just Eric Gentry who feels that way, but, uh, and uh, if I'm Mason Cobb, I look at it and say, okay, I played pretty well at Oklahoma state last year was something of a struggle. And I'm guessing that Mason Cobb sees last year as something of a struggle because of the defensive scheme that they were in. It's hard to be, it's hard to be effective at inside linebacker. If you can't be aggressive, it's hard to be a sure tackler when uh when you're a step late getting to the hole and the running back has room to maneuver and and so these are problems that i think this current usa defensive staff will find a way to solve i think i think the guys will play faster and i think they'll play more confident and that's going to result in better play i also agree with eric that this does look like a position where you could imagine them bringing in another body we talk a lot about you know uh, another inside defensive lineman, which wouldn't surprise me if they did that either. But I actually feel pretty good about that that defensive line group. I I, I don't know that they're going to be what Georgia's had over the last few years, but I think they're going to be pretty solid, even with the group they have right now. I think it's a pretty good group and well coached. Linebacker, I'm a little less sure. I'm never sure whether Gentry is going to be able to stay on the field. Um, I, I think the you know I think the other two guys. Um, uh, will probably do a pretty good job, but Mason Cobb struggled a little bit last year, and and so he needs to step his game up. I think he will, but that's not a position where if a guy who is uh, a, a first uh, a first day draft choice or a second day draft choice says he wants to come to USC, where you just uh, where you tell him no. I think you tell him yes and see how he fits in the room, but. Um, I guess we have only uh, only a little over, uh, uh, I guess a little less than two weeks, and we'll see a little bit something on the field that we can watch. But uh, certainly, certainly there, uh, I, I think everybody's expecting huge strides defensively, and 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 I think we're going to see some of that. Maybe not in the spring game, but um, uh, but in the fall. That group uh, okay. is going to get such an assist from the way the defensive line is going to play this year. Forget forget about the defensive line being better. Just yes. what they're going to be asked to do. You you mentioned there were times where the inside linebackers would be three, four steps late there. There were also times where they'd make the right read and three offensive linemen would be right, right in there that they'd have to take on because the defensive line just angled past them and took themselves out of the play. So I, I think the way that they're going to be asked to play and the the 
physical nature of that defensive line is going to help the linebackers as much as anything the linebackers could even do to improve themselves this offseason. I agree with that. And look, uh, people don't understand if if you haven't if you haven't played uh, or or paid attention to the game much, and you're a casual fan, you probably don't realize just how quickly offensive linemen we get to the second level against USC's defense the last two years. They, they, there was they, nobody was running through offensive linemen. They were running around them, and offensive linemen are three, four, five yards deep immediately. It's almost impossible to play linebacker like that. It's almost impossible. And so, as we talked about last week, this this business about uh, where Josh Henson was mentioning, we got defensive linemen that are running through our offensive linemen uh, on their way to their assignments. That makes a huge difference. I mean, if guys aren't getting a free release where they're where they're able to cut off the linebacker immediately, that's gonna that's gonna help. So I agree with Eric. I look, I've said it a bunch, and it's probably beating a dead horse, but everybody likes beating dead horses around here. The fact is. Last year's scheme was an unmitigated disaster. It was horrible in just about every way. And, uh, and it, made, it made some guys who potentially can be pretty good football players really struggle on a consistent basis. And I don't think it's that all those guys just stopped, stopped understanding how to play football or, or became less talented. Uh, if you're put in a bad spot pretty consistently, and if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to look bad. Okay. Topic number two, this will be fun. We get to make fun of ESPN again, but there was a um, ESPN, ESPN came out with its top 10 list for college football coaches this past week. The guy at the top is not a surprise to anybody. Kirby Smart, I think it'd be hard with, with Saban's retirement, it'd be hard to put anybody else in that spot. Now, Kalen DeBoer, number two, obviously had a great season at Washington, very good coach, but number two, Kyle Whittingham, three, Dabo Sweeney, number four. Mike Novell, number five. Dan Lanning, six. Steve Sarkeesian, seven. Lane Kiffin, eight. Lance Leopold. And for all those people saying, who is that? He coaches Kansas at number nine. And Ryan Day all the way down at number 10. No Brian Kelly. No Lincoln Riley. What do we think about this list, fellas? Mark, start us off. What do you think about this list? Yeah, They never tell us who compiles this list. I think that should be the first Lance thing. Leopold. <laughs> you sure it wasn't Leopold and Loeb? Um, yep. Anyway, <laughs> this li- again, who put together this list? Did they just put on a blindfold, start throwing darts at names on the wall? And like you said, Kirby's smart. He belongs at the top of the list. Uh, I- I'm trying to look for some rhyme or reason here. Is it, you know, doing more with less? Did, you know, Kalen DeBoer has built programs where he's been before. Is that why he's number two? Uh, do they anticipate him just being able to roll on into Tuscaloosa and taking what Nick Saban did and just keep it going? I don't know. Kyle Whittingham, again, is he does he do more with less? Is he getting that type of credit for being slotted number three? Dabo Sweeney, I, again, I don't understand the list, so I can't – me commenting on it is – it's it's kind of worthless. It's just oh, – it looks okay, – then, then be quiet. Be quiet. Let's let Eric talk. If you comment on it, it's kind of worthless. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, this is what happens when Saban and Harbaugh both leave college football in the same offseason and and wires just kind of get crossed. So I I think the thing to point out about this is that Kirby Smart, there were 10 people who voted. Kirby Smart was first place in all 10. Kalen DeBoer got 62 points. So the drop from one to two is, is massive. So Kalen DeBoer at 62 points is averaging what like fourth place in in the 10 ballots there so if if you're doing that guys were all over the place and so i think that's what this mostly says about college football right now is if you want to be number two do it like right now if you play for the national championship this year and you're not kirby smart you're the number two coach in college football and so i think that's kind of what i take from this where Lincoln Riley's he's he's 12th on this. He's not he's not 50th or anything like that. Uh if you want to talk about the specific things, I, Dabo because of what he's done historically, nobody has what he has outside of Kirby Smart on that list. So 
My first glance looking is he doesn't belong at four. He belongs way lower. He actually probably belongs higher when you're taking in everything that he's done. Now, recently, his resume, his resume value would put him higher than four. I think two, I think he's probably two, just based on the national championships and all of that. Where he is right now and what you think of Clemson as a program right now, 10, 11, something like that, sure. The one that jumps out to me, and I, I, I'm going to set this ball on a tee for, for Chris. I mean, Dan Landing at six, he's been a coach for two years and hasn't won a conference championship. He's lost three Pac-12 games in two years, and then Ryan Day's lost three Big Ten games in five years, and, and he's four spots lower. So, I, I again, I you can rearrange this stuff and however you want. Deion Sanders got two votes uh, in this thing. I think it's not that hard. Like We talked about USC not being in the top 25. Like They, they should be 2021, 20, something like that. Lincoln Riley should be 9, 10 at worst in something like this based on, again, the, the college football playoff appearances and all of that. It's more national media saying, we don't believe that you can put a defense together because historically you haven't been able to. And, and I think that's a hit when you are at a school like USC that you can hold against him more than maybe you will with somebody else because it's a school like USC. And I think that's what is being said with all of these things is there's just, there's there, they don't trust Lincoln Riley to be able to do it. He's got a ton to prove, I think uh, this season. And we talked about that with recruits, talked about it with fans, all of that. It's, it's, true and this is where you see it well usc can always say they had two of the top 10 at one point right yeah no they can and, and look here's the thing i think eric's right ultimately kirby smart's position was obvious and and after that you don't have a lot of established guys dabo has Dabo's resume puts him as one of the top 10 coaches in the last 25 years i think when you look at career accomplishments but it's pretty clear that his program is not only on the downswing, but it doesn't look like he really has any idea about how to save it, right? I mean, now with NIL and the transfer portal, and he doesn't want to participate, and he wants to do things the right way, that's fine. He can do things however he wants, but he's not going to be winning national titles with that, with that attitude. He's just not. Some of the other names on the list, I mean, Novell at number five, okay, Florida State had a great year this past year. His resume at number five, I mean, he doesn't have a better resume than, than Lincoln Riley, does it? It doesn't even make sense. I mean, it's it's a silly, it's a silly, Dan Lanning, you already talked about Lanning. I'm not going to focus on Lanning. Lanning hasn't done much yet except talk a lot, but that's, but that's perfect for the Oregon brand. But Steve Sarkeesian, Sarkeesian had a really good season this year, but in terms of his career resume, Sark was at best a C minus coach at Washington and at USC at best. Right. And, and, and you're talking about two programs that are capable of winning football games. And he's had, and, and he's had two years at Texas, one of which was a good year. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know what to do with that. Sark is an A recruiter. And until he proves otherwise, a C-minus coach. He had a ton of talent on that roster this year. It helps that Texas was willing to get out in front of the NIL and, uh, and, 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 and be offering big bags of cash before lots of other programs were. That probably helped. We'll see if Sark keeps it up. Lance Leopold, I mean, I didn't even – honestly didn't remember who he was when I first saw the name. I had to go look it up, and then I realized, oh, he was an amazing Division three coach, but he took over a program that was already killing it. He was okay at his at his next stop, and he's had one good year at Kansas. I don't know. I mean, Martin Mangino had a good year at Kansas, too. In fact, a better year than Leopold did. i, I got to tell you, I don't understand this list at all. If I'm Ryan Day and Lincoln Riley and Brian Kelly, all three of those guys, I'm looking at this list and saying, what are you talking about? Did, did you guys just watch college football last year for the first time? Is that – is that how far back your memory goes? Because that's nice. I mean the the Norvell thing is for two years at Florida State and and it's basically I think two wins against LSU. So if Riley wins his first game this year, he's number five. I mean Norvell yeah. look, what they did this year and and 
the injury and how it ended and it's frustrating and maybe they do maybe they do win the national championship uh this past season but his wins are i mean overtime against clemson this year you beat like terrible miami and florida teams and 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 that's it and that's it outside of those two like kickoff games against lsu the last couple of years i mean i didn't like it that an undefeated conference championship team gets left out of the playoff but if you look at if you look at what they accomplish you think that they might be a great football team but there's no reason to believe that based on who they played and how they beat them i mean it's just i there's no reason that we need to there's no reason we need to take these sorts of lists very seriously the whole reason you have them is so people read them and get animated and talk about it but whoever made the list i mean it's silly ryan day at 10 behind all those other guys lincoln riley brian kelly those are all coaches that have done a lot more than five six of the guys ahead of them on the list it's just dumb but i I think what again what i think it shows is without without saban without harbaugh If Riley puts it together this year and USC really goes and makes noise in the Big Ten, he's a he's a top two coach. He's a top three coach. And, and, you know, without a whole lot of competition there. Yeah. What do you say, Mark? I was going to say, at least I'm not alone. You don't understand the list either, Chris. So we're we're two peas in a pod. No, but I would never concede that what I have to say about it doesn't uh, isn't worth listening to. It might not be, but I will never did it. Eric, did you find out who the 10 people who – put together this this list were can we make one of those? It, i mean it's it's the college football reporters at espn it's the it's the ones that write the stories cover the teams i i don't Maybe again I, I don't think one to ten. i i think it's you know with it being that close two through 15 or whatever it was if you had one guy that stuck landing at two or whatever at two, like that, that can bump them six spots in the list when it's when it's so congested like that. All right, let's talk about our next topic. Uh, there's been some um, some chatter recently about a new proposal to restructure college football. Now we talked about we've talked about in the past that college football is almost certainly moving away from the NCAA. It's moving towards either one or a couple of power conferences that that will gobble up all the major players. None of that was surprising. What's interesting to me are some of the details that came out in in this uh, this proposal. And this wasn't this wasn't a proposal that was just tied to internet rumor. I mean they they were naming names about the people involved in this and 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 offering some detail. So they had 70 College football would be reworked where you have an upper division of teams that are playing for the playoff championship, and then you have lower to lower levels behind uh, below them. 70 permanent teams in that upper division, and then 10 more teams that would be competing on an annual basis that came up from the lower division because they had played well there but could be relegated if they played poorly. So you have the possibility of a Ted Lasso situation. Um some sort of even money split amongst the divisions, meaning you wouldn't have you wouldn't have what you have now where the conferences have their own TV deals that are wildly different. But that doesn't mean there's a there there's an equal sharing of money because apparently it does make room for the elite programs who drive ratings getting more money than than others. So this is sort of the this is sort of the uh, the framework they're putting together. Uh, so I got a few questions for you. Number one, what do you think of this relegation thing? They didn't flesh out the details, but what do you think about the concept of teams playing to see having late season games where teams are two and nine playing each other to decide who's going to get thrown down to the lower division and who gets to stay in the upper division? Uh, what, what, what do we think of this? I I love I love relegation. I love it. I love the idea of it. I love everything. The the one question where I would have, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to ultimately land on the other side. I, I, I think it's good, but if you, right, you have a quarterback injury early in the year and no way to kind of respond to that, you get relegated because of, of that, right? If something like that kind of derails your season, that's rough. Again, it's also kind of sports, right? I mean, that, that can happen. So I like that idea. I don't know if I love 
having permanent teams. I don't know if I love like the A's right in, in major league baseball, being able to exist and just coast and never have to try. And you just get to stay around. I mean, if you're one of those 70 teams you initially go in with, and maybe you just say five, hey, over five years, these teams can't go. And then they, then they get in the pool where everyone can go up and down, but are, would, would, some of those programs just be comfortable collecting money and not putting anything into it. And again, well, coasting and finishing like down low. Yeah. There are programs like UCLA there, I program mean, like right. Pac 12 programs for a long time, yeah. just co- collected the check Cal. and coasted through and they were fine. Cal Stanford, Vanderbilt. I mean, there are plenty of programs that are like that. Yeah. But I'll if Boise you- state was jumping into the Pac 12 and Stanford had to, had to push or Cal had to push or do that, it, it would have made it, it would have made it interesting, which is why I like, I like that idea because if you right, if you drop down, you should still be able to get back up pretty quick. I mean, if you're dropping down a whole level, the expectation wouldn't be, oh, now you're there forever. You're still yeah. one of those top eighty teams theoretically. If you're the last team to get relegated, then you're probably pretty good compared to the to the rest of the teams below, right? But. At the same time, I get why you'd have some programs that aren't going to get relegated because of a single bad year. I mean, USC won three games once with Larry Hilton. Oklahoma won three games uh, once. Uh, Brian Kelly had a, what, a four-win season? UCLA had a two-win season. I mean, one season, if you're, if you're historically a top 25 program, probably shouldn't send you tumbling down the ranks. But, look, I love relegation, too. I love it because... Um, what they found is a way to make those games that nobody wants to watch and there's no reason to televise to be incredibly meaningful and actually and actually have ratings. I don't know how long, how many years I would go into watching those, those games that determine relegation. At some point, I'd probably get bored of it. But in that first year, I guarantee I'm watching the relegation games. And You'd know all the scores, too, later. I mean, if you didn't watch them, you would check in on those yes. games before the 6-6 six and six versus a 5-7 and seven team or whatever. You're, you're finding the, the 79th and 80th best teams in the country are playing a football game that's actually going to add revenue to everybody and add interest. It's, it's, it's brilliant, I think. So I'm in favor of relegation, but 70 permanent teams – strikes me as way too many what do you what do we think about that that's more than what you had in the in the power conferences over the last five five ten years and, and granted you could say well teams like boise probably belong in, in in those places and that's true but there are also plenty of teams that were in those conferences that don't belong right i mean it's hard to make an argument for vanderbilt or indiana or i'm sorry to say it eric northwestern right it's hard i mean it's hard to make an argument that these are teams that 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 you have to have in the upper division that shouldn't be subject to relegation because these are programs that haven't put in much of an effort for long stretches of time. Uh, so I think 70 is too high. What do, what do we think about that? I, look, why, why are we trying to model the college football game after the European football game? Let, I mean, there's a reason why you know we, we separated from England. We wanted to do things a little bit differently than they were doing over there. Like, why can't we maintain our differences? I think Look, that was in the Declaration of Independence, right? Relegation was one of the things that Jefferson and Adams hated. Hated it. Look, I, the other thing I don't like about relegation, it, it's it's built around a pyramid scheme. So again, like you were talking about, Chris, if you're if you're a part of that upper echelon group, you don't have to worry about anything. You make the rules, you own the rules, you you kind of decide how the game's going to be played. Um, no, it's, it's stupid. Why you're the, well, two, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to challenge two guy, you. You were the two guys who caused traffic on the freeway because you want to watch the car accident. You want to see who's getting hurt the most. No, no. Why are you paying attention to two and no, nine? One of the, one of the greatest like premier league games of all time is, is one of these relegation games. Uh, where there was like a late penalty, they got saved full length of the field goal, and they they you know the team that won. Uh, now I can't I don't remember if they avoided relegation or if they got promoted um, with it. But the, it's it's good football. It it pushes teams to play good football all the way through to the end of the season. We talk all the right the the whole 
oh, when they have the playoff, the regular season isn't going to matter. There aren't going to be games of, of substance anymore. And this is where it is. So the pyramid scheme would be if you only regular, if you only promoted teams and didn't send anybody down. And then we're like, wait a second, we don't, we don't have enough teams in this, in this league. The, the way well, I well, think that you could do that would be, would be interesting. The regular season, you would just, it would be college football. Like the teams you play change every year in terms of non-conference and, and however you'd put it. I think for Chris, your question though, 40 has always kind of struck me that's as, that's as the number. You brought up 40 we programs to football. take it seriously. Hmm? I said, we, we all agree. We're going to two major super conferences. Let's just, you know, well, I don't know if we are. I mean, it, it, I think, I think the idea behind this is that that some of the the some of the have not teams, the the Oregon States or the teams that uh, the teams that are currently in the Big Twelve, some of these teams could get behind something like this because it 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 has a stable structure that allows them to make money, and so it may be that if you go more this direction, then then you don't have the the two super conferences. But I I, I do agree that that's where we're headed. Here's the thing though. Mark, you say, you know, the, the teams at the top have nothing to worry about. Well, they don't have anything to worry about when it comes to relegation. But the teams at the top always have something to worry about because they're the teams that are actually playing for something. USC and Notre Dame and 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 Oklahoma and Texas and, and Alabama, they always have something to worry about because they're trying to win. The question is, uh, the question is whether or not this adds something to the programs that uh, that that tend to be on cruise control and accept their, in the Big Ten's case, seventy million dollars in revenue sharing and don't put forth an effort, right? And and I, I you know I, I suspect most of those teams will find themselves in the top seventy anyway. I they're gonna they're gonna be safe, but but I do think and relegation is gonna be a sideshow, but an interesting one. I do think, though, that 70 teams is is way too many. You have, in 70 programs, you have a bunch that aren't trying to win a championship and don't care. That's too And many. that's where, when they're talking about the even money split, right, for, for divisions, you would need to get a pretty good idea of when you say the elite programs get more, the, the ones that drive TV ratings will get more money. You need to have a sense of what does that look like. Because if you're USC, if you're Ohio State, if you're Michigan – you're you're more okay if you're splitting money with team 30 or 25 than yeah. 70 or 65. I mean that that's a that's a huge difference where you're talking about uh that sort of revenue split and how you get into a situation where some of these low lower schools are just hey I'm I'm here to collect the check as number 70 and we get to stay here for as long as we need to and our facilities look just like yours. Look, and the truth is, you don't have to use any sort of advanced analysis. You sit down people who've been watching college football for a long time, and you say, give me your list of the 30 teams that absolutely have to be a part of this new structure. You're going to have you're going to have almost complete agreement on the 30, right? There may be a few at the bottom, but nobody's going to admit Texas. Nobody's going to leave off Michigan. Nobody's going to leave off Miami. You're not going to leave those teams off. It makes no sense. So my question is, do we need 70? Do we need share? Do we need to one share that much revenue for 70 teams, most of whom aren't aren't putting in much of an effort? Uh, and on top of that, do we really need a 16 team playoff, which is what I think they were proposing? Team number 16 isn't going to win it. They're never going to win it. Team number 16 might win a game every once in a while in the in the playoff, which is fun. But if the goal is just to, but there's always a tension in college football, right, between playing too many games. And uh, which which is a problem for academics to the extent we still care about that. It's a problem for player safety to the extent we still care about that. So how many more games do you want to add when the reality is the top eight is going to get you a national champion and it's almost never going to be number eight? That's that's just the reality. Any other thoughts on this before we move on? I think if 16 beats one in the playoffs, then one gets relegated for that. That's the oh, that only be... chance. No, that would be amazing. Yeah, but then you don't get Purdue playing in the national championship game this year. That's true. That's true. Yeah, but basketball's different. I mean, well, that, that I mean, Purdue was Purdue was a legitimate powerhouse in basketball this year. But you they can were build last a year too. But you can build a basketball power by having a couple of really good players, right? I mean, Loyola Marymount had a season where they were loaded. You thought they have a chance to win it because they had a couple of great players. 
I, look, I just think it's it's not fair to yo-yo the, the Boise states and the San Diego states and the Fresno states of the world up and down every year and say, hey, you're almost there. Beat us and you can stay for a year. Oh, you lost. You got to go back down now. I, I don't fair. know what those teams gain. It may not be well. I'll tell you what those teams gain. They have a chance. They have a chance to play with the big boys, which they do not currently have. And it may not be fair, but it sure would be entertaining. And I would watch. I would watch those games, and uh, and I think a lot of people would. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention it. I think under this proposal, Notre Dame would have to join a division. I don't see. I don't see any independent, uh, any room for independence here. I'm almost willing to sign up just for that. Even though I don't think the big boys would sign off on this, I don't think this is going to be appealing to those teams who are right now in a position where they can drive it, where they get more and more of the revenue that they get here. So I don't think this is going anywhere, but it's fun to talk about. Okay, speaking of fun to talk about, are there just 10 questions? Are we ready to play, guys? No. Almost never. <laughs> <laughs> this, is where, this is where that whole unfair thing, yo-yo relegation that we were talking about just a second ago, this is where that comes to uh, to land squarely on the two of you. And, and I got to be honest, I love it. That's what we're going to do. All right, here we're going to – same rules as always. That is to say, good answers get you a point. Bad answers lose you a point. Complaining about the rules loses you a point. And the 10th question may or may not be worth one point. I don't know. We don't know yet until we get there. All right. What happens if, what happens if you pseudo complain after the game on the message board a day later? <laughs> uh, you're not going to be punished for that right now, but I'm keeping an eye on it. I'm keeping an eye on the comments. <laughs> And it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. It's not that I'm going to take a point away right now, but am I a little bit biased against you going into this game? Probably. All right, here we go. Question number one. We just talked about uh, the power 70, if that proposal were to, be, uh, were to be adopted. So let's start with one of the hard decisions. Who are we going to let into the power 70? Question number one. Who's most deserving of being in the power 70 in college football? I'm going to give you three choices. Boise State, Purdue, or Oregon State? Mark Hulkin, go. Look, as much as I like Oregon State, uh, mainly because they're not Oregon, it's, I'm going with Purdue, and here's my rationale. Hmm. USC's 3-1 and one versus Purdue. However, Purdue's one win. You know when they beat USC? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? They beat them in the Rose Bowl. What that, year was that, Mark? That was, that, that was a great year. I was born no, like then. Oh, 1934. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Mark is going Purdue because Purdue beat USC a very, very, very long time ago one time. Uh, McKinney, what do you think? Boys that was State a team that had O.J. Simpson on it, by the way. Okay. Okay, so they took down, they took down uh, O.J. before law enforcement did. Boise State, Purdue, or Oregon State? What do you think, Eric? Who's most deserving? I mean, I... <sighs> I hate this already. So I first, when I first looked at this, I immediately said, well, Purdue is clearly third in that and it's Oregon state or Boise state. And I looked into it and, and, and it's Purdue, it's Purdue, it's Purdue. Uh, so Purdue and Oregon state, the last time they were champions of their respective conferences, both co-champions in 2000. Uh, for me though, it's right. Boise state, is the initial yeah they've been really good most recently for a lot i mean the entire 2000s right feels like boise state has them absolutely left they're 13 and 8 in bowl games they've got three consensus all americans in history so so much of that has been beating up on those 10 relegated teams and an oklahoma bowl win and I know they've got more than that, but that's what kind of their history feels like. If you look at Oregon State, Purdue, then Oregon State's below 500 all time. Purdue's above 500. Oregon State has that Heisman winner. But if I gave you Terry Baker or Drew Brees, I, I think that's kind of the again, I'm, I'm not saying because Purdue had Drew Brees there that. But throughout history, if you're looking at who's got kind of more behind it, I, I'm surprised surprised that i'm saying purdue i mean even more surprised i'm agreeing with mark but surprised i'm saying purdue 
I'm surprised at both of those things. And I'm going to, I'm going to add to the surprise because I think you're both right. I think it is Purdue. And, and I think, look, right now, right now, Purdue is, is not terribly competitive in football. Boise State, Boise State, they, they don't play elite teams often enough. I mean, the problem that Purdue has or Oregon State has is that every year they have three, four, five games on the schedule with teams that are just that are just superior programs that are probably going to deliver a beat down to them. And if they win that game, great. If you're Boise, usually you, you play in a conference that isn't as good and you'll play two or three preseason games, sometimes against an Oregon, right, or somebody like that, and, and maybe you'll get punched in the face after. I mean, I don't know. These things happen. But, but usually you're playing a Washington State, and you're beating a Washington State. But if Oregon State or Purdue beat Washington State, they don't get to crow about it because beating Washington State just doesn't mean much. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think it's Purdue. This does show, I think, though, that, that the 70 is just too much. It's too much. We shouldn't be arguing about these teams. These teams don't belong in this new mix. They just don't, none of them, despite the fact that Brian Greasy was really good a long time ago. And 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 they did it on Mark's birthday or something. Uh, okay, uh, one one is the score, and um, we're going to move on to question number two. More famous, the aforementioned Lance Leopold or Leopold and Loeb? Who is it, guys? I don't think anybody actually knows about the criminal minds of Leopold and Loeb. I had to look it up. I thought maybe it was a law firm that you might have worked for at one time, Chris. Uh yeah, no. But no, no I, I learned something today. Um, I'm glad I don't know who Leopold and Loeb was to begin with. So I'm going to go with Kansas as head coach. All right. Eric McKinney, more famous. I'm going to go off the board. I'm going to say Lisa Loeb as uh, as more famous between them. I People really like Lance Leopold, right, as a, as a head coach. If you lined up all the head coaches shoulder to shoulder, however much room that took, I I would need I would need 70 guesses I think to to pick him out. Yeah. Yeah, I look I think this one's easy. Uh we have a very we have a very literate and educated audience here. They they all know who Leopold and Loeb are, Mark. So, um and and only about 12% of them knew who Lance Leopold was. Like I said, I had to look him up. When I looked him up, I said, "Oh yeah, of course, the Kansas coach." But the reason I didn't pay attention to that is because nobody has to pay attention to Kansas football. They just don't. And and the fact that he won, I think, eight games last year. I mean, eight games doesn't – eight games may get you in the top ten of the ESPN list, but I think winning eight games once is not exactly something that is uh, – that, uh, that, that we should celebrate that much. So I'll tell you, though, Kansas is going to win a lot of games this fall. They play – they play less than nobody and open with Lindenwood, uh, which, as we all know, the Lindenwood, what, Chris? Well, they they I they play Lindenwood. Um, William Jewell plays Lindenwood. That, that, that very really well may that. be right. Yes. The Lindenwood Lions uh, out in Missouri. Yeah, no, uh, I actually saw William Jewell. This is long after I left the, the school, but I actually went back and saw my alma mater play against Lindenwood, who also had on their team a, a USC recruit that went to Oregon and then left and went to Lindenwood. I wish I could remember his name. Anyway, okay. So I'm officially on the relegation bandwagon now. Kansas is relegated just for scheduling that game. Thank you. Kansas is relegated, but Lindenwood's got a shot to crack the 70. So I'm excited about that. Um Okay, I don't know how to score the last one. I think I'm going to give the point to Mark because he at least answered the question, and I don't think that Eric did. So, number three, I'm going to read to you the top-rated recruits in USC history. They're probably not the names that you'd expect if you're listening at home. Number one, Joe McKnight. Two, Matt Barkley. Three, Corey Foreman. Four, Patrick Turner. And five, Whitney Lewis. You each have 30 seconds to respond to that. Eric McKinney, go. 25. 20. Okay, you just lost a point. You're done. Look, Matt Barkley gets hit because he wasn't a, an NFL star. That dude is the, at the top of any quarterback stat that you could have. And, and his years, 
at USC marred by a ton of stuff that he had nothing to do with. He stood out there in front of the media. I, I, I love Matt Barkley for his time at USC. Joe McKnight would be much better thought of if there wasn't a guy named Reggie Bush that existed just before him. The other three, I have no explanation for, but again, this list is from, I think from 24 sevens, like all time USC recruits. I went down, I tried to find where's, give me a group of five that I could say, this is the five in a row that, that is the best in this group. You have so many just guys that, that, that were nothing right. That either transferred out or just did nothing at USC. I had to get 64 through 68 was the first chunk of five. TJ McDonald, Dwayne Jarrett, Austin Jackson, Tyron Smith, Porter Gustin. That that's the five, like in the top hundred, where you say this is good. There, there are there are a lot of misses up there in, in the top 70. Yeah. Mark, I know what you think because I, I, I know if you think about recruiting lists and stars anyway, but you got 30 seconds. Go ahead. Here's your do softball. I, do I get to reclaim some of my time that Eric took? No, no, okay. you don't. So, he, yeah. he took some of your time, and that's just the way it is. You have 12 seconds. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. That's a lot of five stars. Uh, you are absolutely correct. Let's get rid of the star system. Look, Joe Knight was really good, but was he one of the best to ever play at USC? He's not a top He's not a top 10 running back at USC. He's not. And, and same with Matt Barkley. You take away their win together in Columbus, Ohio, that's their, their, that's their best win as Trojans. Uh, yeah. Yes, although, although – Let's be fair to Matt Barkley, because Matt Barkley is not the greatest quarterback in USC history, but he may have had the most difficult job of any quarterback in USC history, right? Absolutely. Tough. And, and, and Matt Barkley also has the best um, FU touchdown pass against UCLA in USC history, as far as I'm concerned. So That's fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's just get rid of the five-star system, because what you're doing here, you're just putting, you're, you're putting either you're an, you're an NFL All-Pro or you're a bust. There's no middle ground when you're a five-star at USC. Mark wants 10 stars. Yeah. That's, yes. that's his new system. He wants to, he, he, he loves stars so much. He wants us to add to it. Look, I, I don't have a problem with it. Look, the coaches aren't paying attention to, to this. They're not saying this guy's a five-star, so I want him over a four-star. This is just for the fans, and it's for fun. Five stars do tend to shake out in higher percentages than others. You would expect that because they tend to be the guys who are most obviously physically gifted. But this is a reminder to USC fans when USC misses out on the can't miss prospect. Um, there's no such thing. They're just not. There's no such thing. All of these guys were can't miss prospects, and quite a few of them miss. Uh, okay, I'm going to give both of you a point. I think the score is three to one. I think the score is three to one, Colton. I don't even know for sure, but that's what we're going with. Question number four. The worst long-running television show of all time. McKinney, what is it? Uh so I I got I've got a top three list for you. So I'm I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you the worst. So it's anything on MTV after they stop playing music. It's anything on TLC after the late 90s when it was bought by whoever owns Discovery. The worst long-running TV show of all time is literally anything involving a Kardashian. Okay, um, quite a few answers, and uh, I'm not sure. Just one for the worst, though. I'm not sure he identified any specific television show. Mark, this should be easy money for you. Do you have a television show? Well, it's real easy money, because I knew my weekend TV time was over the second Lawrence Welk came on. Once that channel got turned to Lawrence Welk, that was it. And you that show like the bubbles? They had the bubbles at the end and everything? Look, if I don't have Lawrence Welk, it was the Waltons. Either one of those shows made me leave the room when my dad took over the TV. Okay. I'm, I'm giving the point to you, Mark, because you actually answered the question. I've got to be surprised. I never would have guessed Lawrence Welk show. But then again, I've never gone back to check on the Lawrence Welk highlights on YouTube. So there may be a reason for that. I'll probably do that when we're done. Question number five, in what is becoming a route, McKinney? Come on, get your act together. Question number five. David yeah. Bowie or Freddie Mercury? Mark Culkin. You're asking me to choose between a genius and a super genius. So I'm going to give David Bowie the edge only because of his acting ability. And to okay. me, it's the, it's the greatest opening of any movie ever. 
and these children that you spit on as they try to change the world are immune to your own consultations because they're quite aware of what they're going through. Greatest line ever written. Vote for super genius and fine actor David Bowie. Eric McKinney, David Bowie or Freddie Mercury? Uh, so I'm going to go with Freddie Mer Mercury. David Bowie, it always feels like he, I, I'm just not smart enough to understand what he's doing. Like there's something else I should be getting and I and I can't quite. And Freddie Mercury, to me, just kind of blasts you with it. And I'm like, OK, I, I get this. We're rocking. Here we go. The answer is David Bowie. And I, I'll say this, Freddie Mercury, I always got right. Incredible voice. And, and, and Queen had, and Queen had some great songs. I recognize that even when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I did not understand David Bowie. It made no sense to me. It's just within the last five or 10 years that I recognized just how unbelievable David Bowie is. Uh, incredible. I think he's equal to Freddie Mercury as a vocalist. I think he is more creative as a songwriter uh, I'm going with David Bowie, and that puts Mark Culkin ahead five to one. Jeez. But so people, far. People are changing the channels now. I don't even, All right. Number set, uh, Number six. I'd, was there a Lawrence Wilk theme song? I'd start humming it now if we could get Mark to shut his camera yeah. off. It's all It's all over. The bubbles are The bubbles are coming out. All right. Here it is. Mark Culkin. Give me the biggest overachiever in USC football history. The, the, the correct answer is Jake Olson. My answer for the show, just because I wanted to get the dig in there, I think it's Petros Papadakis. Biggest overachiever. Okay, very interesting. Eric McKinney, who's the biggest overachiever in USC football history? Uh, so I'm now it's a debate, right? Do I want to try to come back and give one answer, or do I do I want to give the two that I that I have written down and make Chris upset? I. I'm going to I'm going to play to my strengths. I'm going to give two and make Chris upset. Uh Clay Matthews the 3rd, right? From a walk on to a first round pick and and becoming kind of what he did. The off the radar one I'm going to go with D Damon Bame. Uh came in as a junior college transfer. He was a starting offensive guard and linebacker and I know the weight was different then, but he weighed 187 pounds and was a two-time all-American at those positions and a national championship uh, winner on that 62 team played at USC two years, 62 and, and 63. And again, I know he's not going against 310 pound defensive and offensive linemen, but again, a, a, a Juco transfer then ended, ended up playing those two spots and the accolades that he finished with. Good answer. The right answer is Eric Affolter who came in as a kicker and became Rodney Pete's uh, key target and All-American receiver. Um, but I liked both answers. I'm giving the point to Eric McKinney, largely because I can't afford to have this game get any more out of hand when we haven't even gotten to question seven. Question seven. Give me the greatest athlete of all time. Mark, go. I got Bo Knows. Bo knows how to run fast. Bo knows how to run physical. Bo knows how to hit a baseball. Bo knows how to catch a baseball. He knows how to throw a baseball. Bo Jackson was great at whatever he wanted to do. I Unfortunately, his hip wasn't as great as his sports prowess. Yeah, we kept. But Bo, Bo I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to argue with that, but McKinney's going to do it. Who is it? Well, you know I've got a soft spot for Traveler 7, right? I mean, that that's who, that's what I want to go with initially. So I'm I'm actually glad that, that Mark went, with Bo Jackson, because my guy, I feel like of all the kind of big time athletes that are out there that get listed for this, I, th I think my guy goes against Bo Jackson the best, Jim Brown, uh, for me. So he lettered 10 times at Syracuse in four sports, football, lacrosse, basketball, track. The premier lacrosse league MVP is called the Jim Brown most valuable player did the decathlon, high jump, javelin, discus. He was an unbelievable baseball player. Uh, and I think still the only NFL running back of all time to average more than 100 rushing yards a game still. And he still went to class. Look at that. It's a good answer. It's a fine answer. Now, 
look, some people would say Jim Thorpe, but Thorpe did his stuff so long ago that it's just hard to compare the eras. Dave Winfield was obviously fantastic. I mean, this is a guy who was, who could have been a professional in three sports. Um, you have the uh, you have the Deion Sanders of the world. I mean, Deion. I, I think Dion falls short against Bo if you're doing a straight up comparison between the two. Um, Bo was a better baseball player than Dion, although Dion turned out to be a much better football player than Bo, probably because he played a lot more games and didn't get hurt, but still. I mean, Dion, Dion, you can make an argument, is one of the top two or three players at his position of all time, maybe number one. You can't argue that about Bo in football, and you can't argue that argue that about Bo in baseball. Um, the answer is Danny Ainge, who uh, was both. All right. No, the, the answer is not Danny Ainge. The answer is, um, the answer is, could you go with McKinney? What do you, what was your answer again? I didn't forget. Traveler 7. Jim Brown. Right. Brown. Right. The guy who made an impression. Jim, Jim Brown, Brown, the guy who, before you, before you grade the football players we picked, Bill Belichick called the best football player of all time. So I know you know better than Bill Belichick, so so you can you can give and points. Barry out. Sanders' father says is the best running back of all time, and that Barry is number two. I, I actually think his dad said that Barry is number three, and then and Dad put himself at number two. But in any event, <laughs> um, to keep this game close, we're going to Jim Brown. It's five to three. Question number eight. Now, for a while, it looked like presidential candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. was considering Aaron Rodgers for his running mate. He didn't pick some woman from Silicon Valley, but pick one person associated with USC football at any time as a vice presidential pick and what presidential candidate should they have been teamed up with? Odd question, but I know you guys can handle it. Eric McKinney, go first. Yeah, I, I started to look into this and then I went very surface level with this. It, it's John Robinson and Grover Cleveland, right? The be, being able to come back and do it twice. Okay, not a bad choice. Mark Colton, what do you got? Yeah, if I'm picking my uh, my running mate, my VP candidate, I, I think I've got Lendale White, um, and I'm teaming <laughs> him up with uh, I'm, I'm teaming him up with Trump to be president. Both of those guys do not have a filter. But they say a lot of things I think a lot of people agree with. They just don't know how to say it. They would make an interesting pair, the two of them. I think the answer probably is Pete Carroll. And, and with Pete Carroll, you could go any number of ways. But I think Pete Pete's a lefty at heart. He doesn't talk much about politics, but I know he is. So I think Pete and, and Bill Clinton would have been a hell of a team, those two. Um, okay. Nobody gets a point. Five, three. Question number nine. What would be the best college football relegation game in history? If you could set up a relegation game to watch, what would it be? Mark Hulkin, go. So I, I think it would be funny to watch Army versus Navy just to see um, from that. You want to relegate one of the academies? No, I, I, just from a funny point of view. My actual game that I would schedule – it's a toss up between Notre Dame UCLA and Alabama Auburn. I'm going Notre Dame UCLA because it's more personal for me. Notre Dame UCLA, an obvious choice, but a fine one. Eric McKinney, what do you think? So I went with a real game that I think would be unbelievable if it was a relegation game. The 78 Gator Bowl, watching Woody Hayes punch a Clemson player and then grab an official and just spiral as then Ohio State was relegated at the end of the season and he was fired, that to me is, is comedic timing of how to, how to do that and go out the door as, you're, uh, as, as your team is dropping down a level. Uh, okay, so the right answer is Oregon coached by Dan Lanning against Oklahoma coached by Brent Venables, and I'll tell you why. First of all, those two fan bases deserve it, but it also ties into what Eric McKinney was just talking about. I, I mean, Venables is so unhinged on the sideline that they literally have to pay somebody to grab him and keep him on the field. And Dan Lanning, Dan Lanning would be out of control. He would not only would he be going for on every fourth down, no matter what, but he would he would be doing all kinds of crazy things because when there's pressure on Dan Lanning, he goes insane. 
I would love to see the battle between those two coaches, and I would love to see the anguish, no matter who lost. I would love to see the anguish in that fan base. It would make me so happy. Eric's, Eric's answer was closer to mine. He gets a point. It's five to four, and it's number 10. All right? This is an important question. This is one of those historical revisionism questions. But where would USC Athletics be if USC had hired Jim Cohen instead of Lynn Swan in 2016? Eric McKinney, go. So by now, Traveler, Traveler would be a flying car. Greg would have a life-sized Coliseum torch to light going into our fourth quarters. And USC football would absolutely have a national championship and a, a, another one by now. Mark Holkin, what do you think? Yeah, uh, look, I think the question you're asking is, Jen, does does Jen have the intestinal fortitude to uh, to make Clay Helton her first coach to be replaced? I mean, she didn't officially fire Andy Enfield, but her first major hire was men's basketball coach. You know, if she was here back then, how long does Clay Helton survive? It's hard to imagine. Get, it's hard to imagine him getting the extension he got. But um, and, and look, it may be that we're it may be that we're overrating Jen Cohen at this point. I don't think so. I think she's going to be very very good and will stick around a long time. Um, but I I think we all know where Lynn Swan belongs in the in the list of athletic directors. Uh, and I'm not sure he's at the very bottom of the list. I I think I might even put Pat there. I mean, at least Lynn didn't run onto the field. But uh, in any event, I, yes, Jen Cohen would not have kept the Clay Show alive as long as as long as USC did, and and would have hired a legitimate replacement immediately. Uh, it may not have been Lincoln Riley, but she would have hired somebody good. Um, but we'll never know. Nobody's going to get a point for that one either. Mark Culkin, you're the winner, five four. Congratulations! It's a big day in the Culkin household. Glory for a whole week. How do you feel? I would just like to say the game wasn't as close as the score indicates, but you know it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, you've seen those games where you kind of feel like the refs are aiding the team that's so far behind to make it more competitive. That's sort of what happened. But and and because I did that so much in the second half of the game, I just couldn't. I couldn't give Eric the win. It would have been ridiculous. It what what show do I have to do next week? Like I just, I assume I'm going to a different show and someone's coming here, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to – I was going to say something that would have been nice. I'm not going to take a shot at our competitors. Okay, listen, guys, good show. We got another big week of uh, – another big week of spring practice. We'll do this again next week. Anything we want to say before we sign off? I ask this every time, and you guys have not once come up with something. Except Tuesday, the last, last except 5 a.m. said something and lost the game that he'd already won. Tuesday, last 5.30 a.m. spring ball practice, and, and we're – we're getting there. We're getting there. April 20th is is around the corner. Going to get to see uh some some real stuff. On the Pac-12 network if you uh if you live out of state. Oh, yeah. that's true. Some some of you will get to see some real stuff. This yeah. will be the last USC football game played on the Pac-12 network. Hard to believe. And that's something to celebrate. Era gone by. Maybe they'll maybe they will uh Maybe they'll honor Larry Scott at uh, at halftime of the spring game. That would be appropriate. Okay, I guess we're done. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for watching. Click on the like button. Sign up for We Are SC. You'll get to see what these guys write about during the week. It's actually quite good. Whether you believe it or not, after watching this show, they do a really good job. I read it all. Uh, anyway, that's it. Until next week, bye on, everybody.